the death penalty has been used in Western civilization for a long time. Uh, anytime you killed someone, you were subject to the death penalty in particularly medieval law. There weren't any defenses to it. And frankly, it wasn't until the church started working through the sacrament of confession and suggesting to people that there are some sorts of acts that are permissible or justify killing someone. So, for instance, if you killed someone in self-defense, rather than you being killed, what would happen instead was you would just lose all your property and be banished. That was considered the um, kinder way of approaching the death penalty. It was used in the United States, the first recorded use of the death penalty is in 1608 in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Since that time, it's been used pretty much continually in the United States up until 1972. In 1972, the U.S. Supreme Court decided that the death penalty as used in the United States was a violation of cruel and unusual punishment. It was considered too arbitrary, and that was extended to the states through the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Four years later, in the case of Greg v. Georgia, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned its decision in Furman and decided that, yes, you could have the death penalty in the United States. The change in the methods of execution is, to me, a real interesting phenomenon because it talks about how we want to tidy up murder, uh, murder by the state. At one point, executions were sort of a public thing. In the United States, public hangings were spectacles people would go to. As a matter of fact, there are a number of books that show collections of postcards of people attending lynchings in the U.S. Later on, we've tried to think about execution as a medical procedure, and so we've tried to make something scientific about it. So we either have an electric chair, which was kind of the favored scientific approach to it, and now we go to lethal injection. Lethal injection is a two-part process. You get two different sorts of injections. First, the person who is being executed is given a tranquilizer of some sort, and secondly, a certain sort of poison is injected into their veins. The poison that is injected into their veins is a poison that the Association of Veterinarians in the U.S. will no longer use because they figure it's too painful for animals to bear. So, to suggest that something can't be used on dogs and horses that we're putting down because it's too painful suggests to me that it isn't the right thing to use for um, human beings. The last point here on lethal injection is it's part of the medicalization of the process. It's really painful, but the fact of the matter is doctors aren't permitted to check the dosage. Doctors aren't permitted to be a part of it because doctors have decided that this is a violation of their medical ethics. And so the American Medical Association has said, we are not giving a license to people and we will take the license away from doctors who assist in executions. At one point, the church as part of society took part of that society and said if the death penalty is what is called for by civil society, we probably go along with that as well. We didn't think much of it. The church changes all the time, right? as Judge Noonan writes in his book, The Church Ever Changing, Ever New, is there things at one time we thought were okay with the church. He takes the example of slavery and later points out that we've made it clear now we're not in favor of slavery. On the death penalty, we are moving along a continuum in dialectic, in conversation with the rest of the church, with the rest of society. The church's approach to the death penalty is it opposes it in all situations. It permits it in a very limited situation for third world countries or primitive societies that don't have the ability to incapacitate someone who is dangerous, someone who might kill again. In those situations, the church has said it may be possible to have an execution but it doesn't say it's in favor of it. It says it may be morally possible. The church looks at the question of the death penalty 
from a number of different viewpoints. I'm going to give you two of them. The first deals with the idea of the primacy of life, the seamless garment of life, and the second is the idea of relationship. Cardinal Joseph Bernardine of Chicago gave a talk at Fordham University some years ago where he referred to the seamless garment of life. The image of the seamless garment is the garment Jesus wore when he went to his crucifixion, and folks said, there's no seam here, let's throw dice to see who gets it. Taking that metaphor, Cardinal Bernardine suggested that we have to take that with all the teachings of the primacy of life in the church. And therefore, we have to say that we protect the unborn. We protect the mentally disabled. We protect the physically disabled. We protect those who are poor. We protect those who are facing difficult times in their life. We work for the people who are starving. And we also work for people who are on death row. The Church's theological approach to the death penalty comes out of the idea of the primacy of relationship. When we kill someone, when we execute them, we've given up on them. I worked as a lawyer in prisons when I was in law school. And what you notice dealing with lifers, people who are going to be there for the rest of their life, is they go through a number of stages, but eventually they reach a point of acceptance where they become reintegrated in the community, they start helping people. They can be real forces for good behind prison walls. Retribution is one of the justifications for punishment. It's a fancy word for saying an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, or I'll spit in your milk if you spit in mine. There seems to be a great Old Testament righteousness about it. There's something about it we find understandable. There's something about it that we seem to like, just on a gut level. Of course, when you come right down to it, we can't and don't do that in most areas of crime, right? We don't steal from someone who stole from someone. We don't rape a person who's raped someone else. Um, We don't defraud someone who's defrauded someone else. We've decided that that would be coarsening for society. That would be cheapening the idea of what we should be doing as a state. This rule of retribution, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, is one of the few rules from the Old Testament that Jesus specifically says, we don't follow that anymore. This is problematic, turn the other cheek. Can the death penalty be administered fairly? The sense is it just can't be. I'd like to quote Justice Blackman of the U.S. Supreme Court in an opinion he handed down in a case called Callens v. Collins. Justice Blackman said, rather than continue to coddle the court's delusion that the desired level of fairness has been achieved and the need for regulation has been eviscerated, I feel morally and intellectually obligated simply to concede that the death penalty experiment has failed. Why is it important that Justice Blackman said this? Justice Blackmun was originally one of the Supreme Court justices who was in favor of the death penalty. For a number of years of seeing cases coming before the court, he said, there are just too many variables here. We can't be sure it will be fairly applied. And therefore, Justice Blackmun said, no, it can't be applied fairly. And that would be the consideration, that would be the decision of a number of people I've talked to and worked with. Let me explain why. A number of us are aware of cases we've worked on as prosecutors where a jury of 12 people came back, found the defendant guilty, and later DNA evidence or other evidence cleared this person. We thought the person was guilty. The jury thought the person was guilty. But the hard scientific evidence indicates later that he wasn't. Now, this is done with the best will in the world. We're not out to wrongfully convict someone, but that's what happens. People make mistakes. People are fallible. People are fragile. People are broken. These are the people who make up the criminal justice system. 
It's not a matter of putting data into the computer and having a right answer spit out. Understanding that people make mistakes, we have to understand that there are all sorts of places that could be rife for error within a criminal trial. So, can you make a perfect criminal trial? Probably not, just like you can't have a perfect marriage, just like you can't have a perfect class, just like you can't have a perfect business. There's always going to be something that goes wrong. Well, you don't want to balance that with a human life in the balance. And so, it seems to me, we can't remove the arbitrariness, we can't remove the fundamental doubt of fairness in capital punishment cases. We've been executing people in this country since 1608. Chances are a number of people have been killed who didn't commit the offenses that they were charged with. There are a group of scholars who have looked at a number of cases and looking at cases since I believe 1950 on, they have found 400 cases where people were wrongly convicted of capital crimes that they either couldn't have done because of DNA evidence or they were in prison elsewhere or other people have confessed to the crime and have been found guilty of it. A number of people think that the death penalty is cost effective. It's cheaper to kill someone than it is to lock them up in prison. Every study that looks at this says that isn't the case. There's a Duke study from about 1985 that indicates every capital case in North Carolina cost approximately $2.17 million more than a case of just um, giving someone life without parole. Everyone who's looked at it has suggested it just is too expensive. There was a, someone running for attorney general some years ago in Massachusetts who pointed out that, is the death penalty a good idea? Whether it is or not, the people of Massachusetts just can't afford it. And that's actually been a reason why a number of states have said, we can't do it because just on numbers alone, it's much, much too expensive. For the death penalty to be a deterrent to crime, you have to have an idea of what people are like. You have to suggest that people who commit crimes are in some way rational choice actors, that they weigh the costs and benefits of what it is they're doing, and when they decide to pull the trigger, they have going through their mind, oh, I might be subject to the death penalty or I won't be subject to the death penalty. And that will inform whether or not they're going to pull the trigger, whether they're going to kill someone. Despite the vaunted claims of certain economists, that isn't how real people work. Most people commit murders in a fit of passion. They do so quickly without thinking about it. And they don't think they're ever going to get caught. And since they don't think they're going to get caught, they don't worry about penalty. So the psychology is wrong on deterrence. There is no study I am aware of that has ever said that people who live in states where they have the death penalty have a lower murder rate than states where they don't. As a matter of fact, the opposite seems to be the case. Are there people who are so bad? Are there people whose acts are so revolting that we should approve of and indeed support their execution? Let me tell you a little bit about one of the criminal defendants I prosecuted. Before I became a priest, I was a prosecutor. And one of the people I prosecuted was a serial killer in my hometown, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, named Jeffrey Dahmer. I was one of the second chairs in that case. It would be difficult to imagine someone who committed murder who's more notorious than Jeffrey Dahmer in a lot of ways. He killed 16 young men, he had sex with their inert or dead bodies, he even ate some of the uh, victims of his crimes, I think three of them. Sister Helen Prejean, the author of Dead Man Walking, talks about what do we do when we put someone to death for a crime? And to do that, to commit the act of execution, we have to focus on and define a human being solely and only in terms of the worst thing they've ever done in their lives and say, that's what this human being is made of. That's all this human being is. What was interesting for me working in the Dahmer case was this. I found Mr. Dahmer to be a fairly nice person. 
I talked to a number of his co-workers. He worked at a place called the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And everyone liked him. They thought he was funny. They thought he was engaging. They thought he was charming. Um, his father and mother still loved him. I remembered paging through his baby book at one point and understanding this was a child who had been played with on the knees of his parents and loved and they had had hopes for him. And this is what had happened. Jeffrey Dahmer was an alcoholic. Um, he had some psychological problems, though I don't think he was insane as a matter of law, and the jury found that he wasn't insane as a matter of law. But he was a much more complex person than just the fact that he had committed these murders. And though it's a difficult thing for us to do, as Christians were called, never to reduce human beings to one-dimensional casts of, this is the worst thing they've ever done. We're called to see people in their complexity. We're called to see people as living, breathing, flesh and blood human beings who are made in the image and likeness of God. And what I found dealing with Jeffrey Dahmer was, he was a nice person and there was hope there. And he actually went through a conversion process before he died in prison. And began to come to grips with some of the things he had done and began to see a possibility of living life in a different way. And I think that's what we're called to do. How do we deal with family members who are obviously terribly disturbed? Their family member, their beloved, has been killed by someone brutally, coldly, and they say, I want this person dead. That people feel a need for revenge, that people want to be vindicated, is a human reaction. It's an honest reaction. They have to be listened to. They have to be sympathized with. They have to be respected. There's no question about that. But that doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. That doesn't mean that we should become an instrument of somehow revenging what happened to them. And if you ask someone if this happened to your sister, if this happened to your brother, if this happened to your mom, wouldn't you want the death penalty for that person? That isn't how the state is supposed to work. The state is not an instrument of revenge. The reason we have criminal justice system is to pull revenge out of it. Since the Enlightenment, we have thought of ourselves as saying, we have rules and we have rules we have to follow. Why is it important to follow those rules? Because sometimes we're wrong. As the DNA cases have pointed out, we've been dead wrong in a number of cases, and innocent people have been put on death row who couldn't possibly have committed this crime. You know what? We don't have a perfect system. We can't be sure that we're always going after the right guy. And until we have a perfect system, we shouldn't even be thinking about that. Secondly, Revenge doesn't work. Sister Helen Prejean, in her book, Dead Man Walking, talks to a number of victims of crime. She talks to a guy named Mr. Harvey. Years after the defendant who killed her, his daughter was executed, he's still not happy. He doesn't feel any better. Killing someone doesn't make you feel better about your daughter who's died. It doesn't bring her back to life. So let's not kid ourselves and say, we're doing something for the victims by killing somebody. It isn't for the victims ultimately at all. So the death penalty doesn't deter crime. The death penalty doesn't seem to make victims feel any better. The death penalty seems to be applied unfairly it seems to have racist roots where if you kill a white person, you're much more likely to get the death penalty than if you kill a black person or a Hispanic person. Everywhere in Western Europe has stopped it. Indeed, if someone commits a murder in the U.S. and goes to Western Europe, they won't extradite them back to this country if they're facing the death penalty. That's also true of Mexico. That's also true of Canada. Why do we have the death penalty here? 
As Americans, we like going with gut reactions, but that doesn't mean it's fair, it doesn't mean it's right. And one of the difficulties in the American criminal justice system, not just in the matter of the death penalty, is we've stopped looking at it as a place where experts who've been trained in the field have anything important to tell us about it. And we've stopped listening to them. And so people will say, I don't care what the experts say, I don't care what the elites say, this is what real people think. Well, real people frequently don't know anything about the criminal justice system in this country. And instead what they've been fed is what they see on TV where criminals are really bad people and victims are all really good people and what we have done is we've reduced the complexity of human life into cartoon characters. Well, so long as we look at the criminal justice system as people by cartoon characters, it's easy for us to say, yeah, sure, the death penalty. But once we know someone who's been a criminal defendant, once we've worked in the system, we begin to recognize the failings that are there. We begin to realize how difficult these questions are, and we develop a certain humility. We develop an ability to say, I don't have all the answers, and until I have all the answers, there's no way I can put a human life on the line for this. <laughs>